So you heard my name is Ali. I'm, I've been working as a nurse with NSF for the last eight years. And it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you today on Human Rights Day about the work that I've done with refugees in, in, in the, over these years. I've recently come back from a search and, working on a search and rescue vessel in the Mediterranean. This was uh, one of our rescues. But it's jumping the gun a bit, and I'm going to come back to that later. Because I wanted to, before I start telling you about that, I wanted to tell you why I was so keen to work, do this work in the first place. And it's to do with the, my previous experience of working with refugees, um, with NSF, in other parts of the world. Uh, and learning what unjust and underserved hardships they are fleeing from, why they are trying to find a life of safety elsewhere. This is a quote when NSF was given the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999. This was a quote from his speech. And I think you'll realise that really not very much has changed from 1999 to today. We're still in the same situation. The periphery of our so-called civilised world is where too many thousands of people are at. This was at the beginning of the Libyan conflict in 2011. Uh, I was working just on the border of uh, the Tunisia-Libyan border, and this is just over the border into Tunisia, when millions of people over a six-month period were escaping from Libya, from the conflict in Libya, seeking refuge in Tunisia. Uh, most of them eventually moved into camps. One woman sticks in my mind in particular, she was a young piano teacher, come from a very you know, middle-class background. Suddenly she was in a situation like this, with a young child, not knowing what had happened to the rest of her family. She'd had to leave behind her husband and her brothers and had no idea what was happening to her. <coughs> That's another picture from the same situation. Uh, a lot of Libyan civilians who fled had nowhere to go. The camps were very quickly filled or they didn't want to be in the camps. So they would just live in these little caves for months on end. And uh, MSF was there providing medical help. We set up mobile clinics um, to provide primary health care. A lot of people, there were, at that time in Libya, there were a lot of um, migrant workers, who, who, people who come from sub-Saharan Africa, working in Libya, and they also had to escape. From some countries, the embassies were able to come to Tunisia and repatriate their citizens. But there were people from many countries, such as Eritrea, from Somalia, who could not be repatriated to their countries. And so they went into this camp called Shusha Camp, in a very, very arid area of Tunisia, extremely poor conditions. Um, they were actually there for years. I just realized that they, they have just recently closed the camp after all this time, and uh, the, the last few people have managed to find somewhere else to live. Uh, we heard terrible stories then. Even I remember a woman coming to the clinic who had survived a capsized boat trying to cross the Mediterranean. That was happening then, all those years ago. It's not a new thing. And most, a lot of people in the boat that she was on had drowned and she had managed to survive and she came to our clinic in a very uh, distraught state, understandably. So refugees all over the world are a direct result of conflict. This was in South Sudan. This was refugees who had fled from North Sudan where they were being bombed. They'd, they had walked for three months through the bush just living off leaves and berries and they arrived in a terrible state of malnutrition, dehydration. People were just dropping down on the side of the road, literally, and dying of, of dehydration. That was uh, transporting them from one area of the camp to another. This is now um, in, in the uh, Turkish-Syrian border. This was in Turkey, where people who managed to escape from Syria across into Turkey lived in either vast refugee camps, but actually about 85% of them now are living amongst the local community in whatever kind of accommodation they can find. And this was in a, a, in a garage, there were three families crammed together in this small garage. It was winter, this is not a very clear picture, but just to show you the conditions, incredibly cold conditions in Turkey 
in January. Um, we, NSF, we were providing them, as well as medical care, we were providing them with stoves and with fuel. I remember children running around barefooted in this, these kind of conditions. And we are here in another winter, and some Syrians are now facing their fifth winter in exile. So our job there was to open a clinic for the unregistered refugees who didn't have access to health care from, um, from the Turkish authorities. So people would, as I say, would find any kind of shelter they could, um, unfinished apartment buildings, garages. Um, we even saw people when we went along the border doing a little explo, people living in pigsties, literally. And today, those, those refugees are more vulnerable than ever. They've already, as I said, some of them have been refugees for years now. They've spent all their savings. Um, they're selling off any valuables that they've got. As I said, we set up a clinic, a medical clinic, and this was one of our, our nurses who had fled his home in Syria because the house next door to him had just been bombed. So he, with his wife and his child, just walked across the border. And three years on, these are the, the current figures, there are 12 million displaced, which is half the population of Syria. Four million of those are in, in the surrounding countries. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, and just a tiny proportion have actually made, out of all those huge figures, have actually made it across to Europe. The next pictures I'm going to show you, we, as well as providing medical care in both Libya and Syria, we provide, we had a team of psychologists <coughs> working, and I'm just going to go th quite quickly through some drawings that they showed me that children, Libyan children or Syrian children, had drawn. We're, I don't know if these were things they had seen or things they had imagined, but they're things that should not be in any children's heads. I'm sure you will find those as shocking as I do. But the, how much the children have suffered that they could do these kind of drawings. Some of the little boys said, this was what they did to my father. And a child said that this was women being raped, in front of, obviously in front of her. So we now move on to the, uh, the current situation in, in the MED. Uh, UNHCR says that it's, the actual figure is over 900,000 now who have reached Europe by boat. It's coming up for 1 million, the biggest displacement since the Second World War. And there have been over 3,500 deaths, drowning, 3,500 already in, in Med this year. Now the largest number crossing are uh, coming through the, for the Greece, uh, from Turkey to Greece. And we thought that people would, the, the movement would slow down in the winter. But actually, it's, as you probably know, it's just there's a dramatic increase of people trying to cross the Mediterranean, to the eastern Mediterranean, because they've heard that the borders are closing. So there's been a big rush. Um, and every day now in the Aegean, there are people, there are people drowning in the Aegean. Even today, there was a, a story, terrible, of a, a Syrian family fleeing from... ISIS, seven children and their mother drowned. The, the youngest was 20 days old and the eldest child was nine years old. And they're just one of hundreds who are tragically drowning. So this was the, uh, the clinics that we set. We have mobile clinics all the way up through this whole area, through the Balkans. And that was where I was working on, the, on a boat between Libya and Italy. I was on the search and rescue in the central Mediterranean. So one in four of these 3,500 who've drowned has, is a child, according to the UNHCR. This was actually the first person that I took onto our ship called the Phoenix. It was a little nine-year-old, a nine-month-old boy from Eritrea. And ironically, the day that we took him onto our ship was the, the day after that little Syrian boy had been found drowned. The little Ailan Kurdi's body was found on a, a beach in Morocco. So this was one of the lucky ones. There have been hundreds and probably thousands who have not survived. This is just shows the top nationalities of uh, people arriving across the Mediterranean. 
as I'm sure you all know, there's now this policy that they will only take into the EU refugees from Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. But for instance, on the ship that I was on, we had a big proportion of uh, Eritreans who were escaping abysmal human rights abuses <coughs> in, their, in their country with indefinite military conscription, um, forced labor, enforced disappearances, torture. They have a terrible human rights record. This is another quote from Orbinski, the president of MSF, on his, his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance. So MSF, we, don't, we aren't trying to solve the political issues leading to this refugee crisis, but we are trying to tackle the effects and to relieve the suffering. So now, uh, moving on to the Phoenix and the work that I was, that I was doing there. When we were given the information that there was a boat in distress, we would launch this rib and go with a, a huge sack of life jackets, take them, uh, do an assessment to see who, you know, who needs to be brought back for medical care urgently, and then, trans and then start transferring them onto our boat. So as well as the picture I showed you first of all, this is another. I mean, imagine trying to cross the Mediterranean in a boat like that, holding on to children in the dark, not being able to swim. And the, the, the people smugglers don't come on the boats. They would just pile everybody onto a boat, as you see, incredibly overcrowded, hand them a compass and a phone and say, head that way, Italy's over there. <coughs> Terrifying situation for them. And this is the boat I showed you in, in the first slide. Very dangerous, overladen and unseaworthy wooden fishing vessel. So what you could ask, what would push people to get into a vessel like this, to put their, their, their maybe pregnant wife, their small children into a vessel like this? Especially when they know so many people have already drowned. And the answers we had when we would talk to the people on the boat is, we had no choice. If, if I'd stayed, I would have died. And someone said, if your house is burning, you're going to jump from a window, even if you think you might die, because, you know, it's better to try. So um, there's just been an inadequate response to this human humanitarian crisis. This was one of our doctors examining a refugee on one of the boats that we went out to rescue. Same thing, after eight to ten hours at sea, they're suffering from hypothermia, from general exhaustion, from dehydration. And it's not surprising when you see the type of conditions that they're traveling in. They would be, this is the hold of one of those fishing vessels, and they're just crammed into them. I mean, they told us, you know, they treat us like animals. And they would be sitting in the, in the hold here, rising water, rising excrement, just appalling conditions. The worst situation we came across was uh, discovering a mass casualty in one of these holes of 52 people asphyxiated by the toxic diesel fumes because the, you know, the, whole, the, the generators are so badly um, taken care of. Um, so it's just pretty unbelievable. So people would get onto our boat, finally embark em embarked onto our boat, we would give them a bag of coverall, some water, some nutritional biscuits, and they would just go to sleep, just collapse and say that it was the best sleep they'd had in weeks. Um, this looks quite sunny at the moment, but there were times in September when we had huge waves just breaking over the whole uh, deck of the boat and trying to move people to a safe area. It just wasn't easy. And I remember one Somalian woman who didn't even get as far as this deck, she just collapsed as soon as she came on through the little embarkation gate. And when I took her into our clinic to talk to her and see what was the matter, she told me this story of how her, her family had just been shot in Somalia by Al-Shabaab, and so she'd fled on her own. So the boats were, our boat was sometimes very crowded. We, had, we took up to 410 people once, just using every little bit of deck space we could. Quite a challenge. We were only three medics on the boat. This was one of the other nurses I was working with. Um, so we would have uh, mostly have the men up on the top deck. And this is this, my colleague who was taking care of people up there. Um, the main things they were, we were encountering was like mild dehydration, hypothermia. Um, uh, the hypothermia we could take care of quite, quite easily. There was also just headaches, general body pains, exhaustion, a lot of motion sickness, respiratory tract infections, 
and a lot of skin infections because um, the stories that we heard of how people cross Libya before they even reached the Mediterranean they have done this in incredibly long journey across West or East Africa and we were told stories of how you'd be piled into the backs of these trucks if you fell off you would just be left to die no food no water so before they've even reached the Mediterranean, they've, they've gone through these thousands of miles crossing the desert. When they reached Libya, a lot of them were just put in detention. Um, a photographer and a journalist came on the boat with us and told us, uh, showed us photographs that they'd taken in the Libyan camps. So when we had a, a young Eritrean man completely covered in this terrible skin infection, he'd been held in detention for six months in Libya. And that's why he had, uh, there was a lot of scabies and just general skin infections. Also, this is uh, treating a young man with bullet wounds. There were lots of people who came on with bullet wounds. He's, he said that when he'd been getting on the boat, the smugglers had tried to extort more money from him. He hadn't got money, and so they just shot him. This was um, an, another very sad case. We had a boatload of uh, young girls from Nigeria who were very badly burned with chemical burns. They had been trying to lighten the load and they had, in trying to put some diesel into the, over the edge of the boat to, throw it to lighten the load, they spilled it in the bottom of the boat. So these young women were sitting in a mixture of uh, diesel and, and seawater sea for hours and they came on with incredibly bad burns on the backs of their legs and their bottoms. And one girl was dead. Um, she just died. Her sister, who had, they were in Nigerian, her sister told us how they, her parents had been killed by Boko Haram. So that she and her sister decided to flee. And she said she just watched her sister drown in the boat as water entered her head, entered her mouth. There were lots of children on, on some of the rescues. There were 28 on this one. So trying to keep them, give them all a warm meal was quite a challenge. And sometimes I would stand at night um, in the bow of our, our big strong boat and look out at, at the black Mediterranean all around me and try to imagine what it would be like if you were a mother like this with small children on one of those, you know, shambolic looking vessels, how, how scary it would be. As well as mothers and children, there were also a lot of young people travelling alone. There were a lot of young women from Nigeria who we were worried were maybe being or sex trafficking carrying on and we tried to follow up on that. Um, there was one young Nigerian girl who turned out to have a sexually transmitted disease, infection. She told us the story how she had been forced into prostitution by her aunt and then was threatened with branding, which was why she was, had fled on her own to try and make a new life for herself in, in, in safety. This was uh, after disembarking in Italy. They would have a um, they'd be triaged, they'd be assessed, and then they would either go to a hospital or they needed further medical treatment, or they'd wait in a transit camp for processing. And who knows what awaits them then. There was one young Syrian refugee on our boat, 21-year-old, <coughs> who had applied for asylum in Egypt for 13 different countries, including the UK, including Germany, including France, and he'd been refused at all of them. This and now I hope this is going to work. This is a video of a rescue on, from one of our other boats. It's now about 6 o'clock in the morning from our rescue yesterday morning. And you see the situation of the guys on the deck here now. They're, they're wet, they're cold. The spray coming over the boat. We got the call at about uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, this is what we found.
these people have not been rescued. And there's no way that the rubber boats, the fishing boats, the overcrowding of wholly inappropriate boats they were put out to sea and could have made this journey. It's not acceptable at all. So I'll leave you with the, the next small video that I took, uh, a boatload of Eritreans, and this is their response when they saw, they saw the coast of Italy. They just broke into this incredible chanting and singing of joy and of relief and of, of hope and expectation. And it made me cry because I thought, they think they've reached the end of the road, but in fact, what kind of a welcome are we going to be giving them in Europe? Probably the questions will be until the end.